under these waves is a complete ancient Greek city over 2,500 years old on the coast of Libya near Benghazi. Libya at that time was ruled by King Idris and the military security was provided by the British Army after the defeat of the Italians in the Second World War. And we arrived in 1958 on the Italian cargo ship uh, Città di Livorno. The team I was leading was 10 divers from Cambridge University. The cargo which we had to carry with us was compressors, diving gear, a small boat and so on. And the donkey carts in the harbour uh, took the gear from the ship to a bus for transport to Apollonia. The port had only quite sporadic cargo work to do, so the dock workers here are actually fighting for the coupons that permit them to work for a day in the port. As we drove east, we passed camel herders, and uh, this co convoy of camels are, are rolling in the dust, and the herder seems to have lost some of his uh, flock because he's chasing after them. We're heading east uh, towards the Greek ancient cities. Uh, this is Tokra, and you can see columns still standing. And these sites have been excavated by Richard Goodchild, who was the British uh, curator for archaeology uh, in, in Libya. At Apollonia itself, when we drove down to the shore, you can see the islands outside the uh, harbour area and the basilicas on shore. The basilicas are Christian of the 5th, 6th and 7th centuries AD, whereas the foundation of the city itself is about 650 BC, so that there are successive areas of ruins. Here we are going into the sea now. And you can see masonry blocks and rectangular blocks of a wall. These are the earliest stage of foundation of the city. And a diver now swimming forward, a snorkeler carrying a drawing board on which he can write and a coloured ranging pole to get the uh, water depth and the exact corner of buildings. You can see the strata of blocks of the structure at a quite substantial fort building at the entrance to the harbour. The diver is marking all the corners and writing them down on the drawing board so that we can survey them in later. It was quite difficult to write underwater and in those days there was very little equipment for divers so that we used formica which was a newly invented plastic for kitchen tops. Uh, underwater cameras as such were very unusual at this date and we have a Leica 35mm camera with a 50mm lens inside a pressurised house. Bill Hemmings is taking the diving equipment off here and handling it to Richard Windred. This rail track here is where Richard Goodchild's uh, debris from the excavations is being thrown into the sea. I'm rowing an inflatable boat out towards the islands, which are about three or four hundred metres offshore, and they mark the outer edge of the ancient city. We're rowing in now to the slipways, which are carved rock channels where the king of Apollonia, or Cyrene, kept their fighting warships. The, these slipways would have been almost dry. Uh, now they're completely submerged. Here divers are swimming out with ranging poles to actually take the fixes uh, with Nick Wood measuring them on shore, taking a sight through a telescope to the top of the pole which is sticking out of the water. Uh, he could fix about 30 or 50 points like that in a day. And at the end of the day, here he is working in a little hut which we commandeered for his draftsmanship.
uh, building up the map of the city day by day. And the map here already is about half finished. We worked every day measuring points and adding them uh, to the city map, revealing the ancient streets and buildings and breakwaters. The team here is getting ready to go into the water with the underwater movie camera suspended from a brass buoyant float, which was in fact an industrial sized ball cock from a very large cistern from a factory. It was the only buoyant sphere I could find to, to neutralize the weight of the underwater movie camera. The area where we're diving here is a very strange depression on the sea floor, about five meters long, two or three meters wide, and two or three meters deep. And the scuba diver here is now just going to descend uh, into that hollow. You can see the divers are exploring the corners of this cutting, which is quite deep. It goes down really several meters. And with sand at the bottom, it may be even deeper. The water depth is three or four meters, which would have been just about level with the sea when the city was occupied. We really tried every technique we could to figure out what this was, but uh, we could never explain it. There were many structures on the sea floor which we didn't identify. The divers swimming there along the rock cut wall on the Western Island, which protect the city from incoming waves. There are rock cut silos for storing grain on the beach, but they're completely flooded now. The basilicas on land, as I said, are Christian, they're much later. Um, we're going back into the sea the next day and approaching what we call Grotto Reef. Uh, here you've got the entrance to the tunnel. On stormy days, we couldn't get in there because the waves broke over it. But it's a complete rock-cut corridor going through a solid massive of rock with arches, horizontal beams still intact. And I imagine that it was a, an emergency or shortcut route. It would have enabled a group of guards or soldiers to go quickly from the center of the city onto the outer wall in case there was an attack coming from the sea. The diver's just got under the roof. He's coming out of the arch at the other side. Uh, there's the main arch going across. He comes across a submerged road. And then another arch facing the open sea. This was quite severely damaged already when we found it in 1958. But since then, the French divers who went back in the 80s, they say it's been almost completely destroyed. And the camera now follows the diver through the tunnel. And you can see where the daylight comes in, where the roof is already partly uh, broken. But this horizontal flat roof underwater is the only known uh, existence or survival of a building on any underwater city. Uh, where the roof itself is intact under the sea. Of course, I didn't know that in 1958, but having studied many cities since then, I know that there's nothing else like it, and unfortunately it's been lost. So the damage is really very, very sad. This is the only documentation of this material. We went out to the West Island. There were 10 slipways about five to six meters wide, where the warships would have been dragged up uh, out of the water to store when there were no battles going on. Uh, they didn't keep them in the, in the sea all the time. I mean, cargo ships obviously were going backwards and forwards uh, whenever there was anything to be brought along the coast or taken across the northern coast of the Mediterranean. Fallen uh, amphora jar, dolium, one of the divers swimming through it, and there's quite a lot of walls on top of the slipways, which clearly show that they became disused at a later time. This stepped masonry is one of the 
uh, block forts that guard the entrance to the harbour on the north and south side. There was a channel going from this closed basin out to the commercial harbour, which was much less well uh, defended. These rocks have been moved recently, either by a storm, but you can see a completely fresh uh, s surface of the uh, ashlar block with no weed on it. In 1959, when we were out there, Hugh Edwards, our Australian diver, found this huge block of stone with a hole in it lying on the seafloor at nearly four metres depth. Uh, he realised that he couldn't find it again if he swam away, so he went down, picked it up and started walking with his fins on the seafloor. I mean, he had to take a breath on the surface get his deep breaths, swim down to the bottom, pick up the stone and walk ashore. Uh, when I found him on the shore with the stone, I told him, I'm sorry, Hugh, you may be absolutely exhausted, but you've got to do it again for the camera, which he did, being a noble fellow. The fish tank is a rock-cut pool at the eastern end of the city, right by the theatre, and Martin Minns is swimming along now and this would have been the, uh, the walkway round the pool, which is at a depth of 2.5 metres. And then there's a wall protecting it. Uh, Natalka swimming along there by one of the channels which comes in to control the water flow in and out of the fish tank. The Romans kept lots of fish in these pools, partly to keep them fresh, um, but they were also decorative. Um, a pool like this, about 30 metres by 5 metres, would have been a very pleasant place to have potted plants and uh, a sunshade and drink your evening glass of wine. And these are the curved channels which had a perforated sluice gates to control the water. Uh, with the small Mediterranean tide, the water would flow in and out of the pool to keep the water fresh. There's a flight of steps down into the pool, so we can tell that, that was a level at which people walked. And these big rectangular blocks in the middle of the pool were probably uh, connected to the side, perhaps with gangways, so that slaves who were feeding the fish uh, could walk across and drop them in wherever. And you can see that there are very big marble blocks, but also very big ashlar blocks which could not have got there by chance. These big blocks must have been the end of the, of the rubble breakwater. They're about three or four metres long, absolutely enormous, and four or five metres deep in the water. But there are plenty of examples of uh, Greek breakwaters uh, built in five metres or even ten metres of water depth. Hugh and Martin Menz were exploring the fish tank uh, on the last day and they started to get very curious about a piece of marble projecting from under a big block. Uh, they pulled away the covering blocks and found the torso of a marble form, which they're now bringing to the surface. It's a beautiful little statue, not uh, what one would call high art, but it shows how the, the fish pool would have been decorated with statues and plants and sunshades and so on, so that people could sit there and enjoy their evening drinks. And you can see it's really quite a fine sculpture. When I visited Apollonia in 1958, uh, I was not even studying archaeology. I was doing physics and chemistry at university. There was a lot of publicity in those days uh, from uh, Jacques-Yves Cousteau and finding ship, ancient shipwrecks. Uh, but nobody had explored or mapped an underwater city to any extent. It was the first time that anybody had mapped a, an underwater ruin on this scale and with this accuracy. The ruins are about 800 metres long and three or 400 metres wide going offshore and we mapped the whole area with an accuracy 
of the order of plus or minus 20 centimeters. With individual buildings, which were measured with a tape or a, a ruler, the accuracy was about plus or minus two centimeters. It was completely unique to record all sorts of buildings, some of which we understood and some of which we didn't understand at all. We just had to measure the shape and plot them and then try and figure out afterwards what they meant. Having done that, the second most important point was that we could actually derive the stratigraphy of buildings which were on top of each other. And because of the different depths of the water with buildings at different depths, we could work out how the sea level changed or the land went up and down during the thousand years or so that the city was occupied from 650 BC to about 650 AD. In that time, many different layers of buildings were put in. And at one point, we were able to find four different layers of blocks showing different shaped buildings, one on top of the other, with a small basilica with an apsidal end at the top level. Uh, other places, we were able to plot buildings in profile, showing the masonry layers uh, offset one against the other to provide the extreme stability, either against military attack or waves breaking against the seawall. So that the interpretation of this was really quite profound because we could see from the, the stratigraphy of the buildings and the water depth that the city had actually come up at some stage so that the periphery of the harbour contracted, the circumference moved in, and later buildings were put on top of the slipways and other things which had been in, uh, in the water or rather they came out of the water and then had buildings put on top of them. And then much later, the whole city went down by more than three meters. Um, the value of the early maps and photographs is almost more now uh, than it was in the 50s and 60s when we first did it, uh, because the damage to the city is really extraordinary. When we visited it first in 58, 59, we could see that there was damage. You could see things were falling and broken. Uh, we also knew that a map of the coastline, coastline made by the Royal Navy in 1824 showed that the coast was a bit further forward, so that the erosion had uh, destroyed some buildings on the beach and left the ruins on the sea floor. Obviously, we mapped what we found in 58-59, but when we went back there in 2003, all sorts of things had changed. The grotto reef and tunnel had collapsed completely. Uh, a huge rock wall at the back of the West Island, which was about 20 metres long, two metres thick and five metres high, had been destroyed by waves uh, breaking on it from the outside, from the open sea. And blocks of, of stone as big as an American motor car had rolled onto the slipways. A lot more sand has been washed into the city because of the waves now breaking through the gap uh, in the Western Island. And we could report, because of what the French found, that there's so much damage now, there are the things they could not have drawn or mapped because the only maps they've got are what we did in 58, 59. So that the mapping which we did then is now an, a unique record and it cannot be done again. But to my mind, it really is important to map what is left because modern survey techniques really are more accurate um, and we understand so much more about harbour technology so that we could reinterpret the buildings. But of course, there's a civil war in Libya and I know for a fact that the archaeology in that area is being destroyed on land very rapidly.